tales for dark nights. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The following program is intended for mature audiences and may contain strong language, adult themes, and content of a violent and sexual nature which may not be appropriate for everyone. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. If it's the darkness you seek, you won't be disappointed. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it's time for our appointment. In this place, there is no sun, and nightmares do come true. Here, instead of shadow falling, the shadows follow you. Consider getting comfortable before the air grows colder. Prepare yourself, if you dare. Come, inch a little closer. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. We have but one story for you this evening, and it's one for the history books. A last surviving record of an American military deployment to get to the bottom of what's fishy in the loathsome town of Innsmouth. The chronicle of the struggle that ensued on those unhallowed streets proved too epic for a single episode, so be sure to join us again next week for part two. Thus, without further ado, from author Artyom Derechuk, I give you part one of The Siege of Innsmouth. Recently, my grandfather died and me and my family inherited his house. We didn't actually need it since it was in another state, so we decided to sell it and use that money for something else. But, before that, we decided that we should clean the house out and get rid of all the stuff that the new owners wouldn't need. It was mostly old trash that Grandpa hoarded over the years, but there were also some things that held some value, either to our family or to some pawn shop. So, during the last weekend, we drove all the way to the house to pillage through all the stuff. While I was going through my grandpa's things, I found an old diary of his father, my great-great-grandfather, which contained some interesting entries. Until I read the diary, I had never heard about the 1928 siege of Innsmouth, Massachusetts. Neither had anyone else, I asked afterwards. But according to my great-great-grandfather, it happened. Not only that, but he was one of the soldiers that had been involved in the campaign. Initially, after glancing at some of the pages, I became skeptical about the diary's contents. I'm not a history buff by any means, but was pretty sure that no conflicts of the sort described had taken place on American soil during the times the diary is dated. I searched for some clues regarding Innsmouth and discovered that it is a completely make-believe town described first by H.P. Lovecraft, a turn-of-the-century fiction author. Yeah, even in Lovecraft's work, there are no mentions of a siege of Innsmouth taking place in 1928, and his story, in fact, took place in 1936. 
It does go on to say, however, that many people from Innsmouth were arrested in 1928 following an FBI investigation. It is also mentioned that during the same year, an American submarine torpedoed the Devil's Peak, a cliff near the town that overlooks the ocean, but that's the only mention of any military action taking place. I had never met the old man, so I knew next to nothing about him, but it seemed to me that he was an aspiring author, as well as a big fan of H.P. Lovecraft's writing, and so I assumed the entries were 100% fictional. Anything was possible. Perhaps his work had been rejected by publishers, or maybe he never submitted it in the first place. In any event, it simply ended up collecting dust in my grandfather's closet until I found it. For reasons I still can't explain, and in spite of my suspicions, I felt compelled to continue reading the contents of the diary. While doing so, I also noticed that the notebook itself was made in 1927 by a small company called Holler and Robbins. Initially, I wondered if my great-great-grandfather had simply hung on to the journal for a long time before making use of it, but found that unlikely, considering that Lovecraft's book was first published in 1936. So I did some more research, exerting a lot of effort and spending quite a bit of time pillaging through mountains of old papers in the archives in search for answers. What I found was... somewhat concerning... I learned that the Holler and Robbins company, which manufactured the diary in which my great-great-grandfather had been writing, was a small printing company in Massachusetts that closed down in 1929 during the Great Depression. Again, the diary itself was made in 1927. My great-great-grandfather never lived in Massachusetts, so his only opportunity to buy such a diary would be if he had been passing through the state. What's more, the story, Shadow Over Innsmouth, wasn't written until 1936. The question remained, if my great-great-grandfather was nothing more than a creative writer, inspired by Lovecraft's lore, how was it possible that he had described the events which had taken place in Innsmouth nearly eight years before they were mentioned for the first time in print? In spite of the intriguing timeline, I remain unconvinced that my great-great-grandfather's story was credible, but I held out the hope that the remaining entries would shed more light on the mystery and provide more clues. As I continued reading, however, the entries quickly became less exciting and far more horrifying. By the time I was finished, I wasn't any closer to knowing whether what was written was true or not. But I do know one thing. I prayed it wasn't. I am determined to share the contents of the diary with others in the hope that perhaps others will be more adept than I at discerning fact from fiction. With that in mind... I present to you now the unabridged written account of my great-great-grandfather, an alleged veteran of the 1928 Siege of Innsmouth, Massachusetts. November 23rd, 1928. Our company was told to keep our mouths shut about his deployment, but that's precisely why I'm starting this diary. If anyone finds out about it, I'll be dishonorably discharged and maybe sentenced to prison. Maybe even worse. It's considering that we're about to wage war against citizens of our country for some unknown reason. But I can't let them walk away with it. If we're about to start slaughtering innocent people, I want to at least document all of it so there is some proof of it in the future. We were told that people of Innsmouth are all guilty of treason of the highest order, but I don't buy that. You don't just send an army to clear them all out, and I don't see any reason to keep it under wraps even if every one of them is a spy. We were told that there would be heavy resistance. But let's face it, if you knew that the army was coming for you and your close ones, wouldn't you protect yourself? Isn't our goal to protect our people? 
This seems more like a crime more than anything else. And we were the mob sent to do the dirty job. The only thing that calms me is my captain's resolve. It appears that he knows more than us but withholds that information for some reason. I can see a fire burning in his eyes, and it's not guilt. It's the hatred for the enemy. But I also know him long enough to see that there are also hints of being genuinely scared. Even though he is not of timid nature, and that makes me wonder what awaits us in the small town that was important enough to keep it a secret, even from us. But also makes the captain shake in his boots. In just a few hours, we will engage into an urban war, and I only hope that our command will be right. Or that we'll all be brave enough to see that they're wrong. November 23rd, 1928. I was wrong. The citizens of Innsmouth are as hideous on the inside as their appearances, and there is no redemption for them. When we entered the town, its streets were already empty. It seems that the locals knew that we were coming and thus left their homes, going into hiding. I have been told that it was a small fishing town, facing the ocean on one side and being surrounded by swamps from all other sides, so I didn't expect to see any riches. But the town looked like it had been abandoned many years ago. Many of the buildings were destroyed, either by fire or through negligence. By the look of them, they had been that way since the middle of the previous century. The other ones didn't look much better. The locals definitely didn't care about how the houses looked or they wouldn't let them stay in such a sorry state. The only indication that somebody lived there at all were the footprints in the mud that covered the roads. Complete with the dark skies above us and the fog that one would expect from such a moist place, the town presented a very depressing sight. And I caught myself thinking that it was easy to believe that no good people could live here. We were slowly advancing through the streets, straining our senses to spot a possible threat, but there was none. There was only silence, undisrupted even by the wildlife, and I could hear every step that me or my comrades took. Even though the weather was cold, I was running with sweat that instantly cooled on my skin under the breeze. I gripped my rifle so that it wouldn't slip out of my hands during the most important moment. They attacked us just as we began to lower our guard. Suddenly the air was filled with noise of shots and bullets started whistling around us. They were armed with rifles and shotguns, and while we were out in the open, they were gunning us down from the windows, having both cover and height advantage. The only reason that me and most of my squad survived this ambush was due to the locals' apparent lack of training and bad aim. The instincts and army training kicked in and we immediately dispersed, trying to get some cover. I spotted a small, narrow alley that went perpendicular to the main street and rushed towards it, intending to hide behind it and continue the fight from there. On my way there, I saw our captain lying and thrashing in the dirt his hands desperately clawing at the shot wound in his throat. The blood was gushing out of it at such a rate that it was clear that he wouldn't survive. Once in safety, I started unloading my ammunition in the direction where the shots were coming from, aiming for the windows. I know that I've said that it felt wrong killing those people without even knowing why, but at that moment I did not care anymore. The desire to live, to survive, had engulfed me, and the instant I saw the ferocity with which they were slaying us, I knew that there was only one way for me to get back home. Over their dead bodies. It must have been the same during the Great War in Europe when the boys, like me, were sent to the front lines whether they believed in their country's cause or not. I could hear the sound of gunfire coming from other streets too, which meant that they attacked other squads as well. And that makes me wonder. 
How the hell did they coordinate their attacks so well? It wasn't like only we were engaged in the battle, no. The whole town suddenly erupted into violence, becoming a battlefield. This was not what you would expect from civilians. Even from the distance, I could see that there was something off-putting about their appearance. Their skin was of sickly gray color, and their eyes were bulging out, giving them the fish-like look. It was hard to aim for their heads, too, because they sunk deep between the shoulders, making them hard to spot. It made it hard to relate to them even as opponents. At that moment, I heard the scream of one of our soldiers behind me, and I belatedly realized that the enemy could also hide in the buildings near us in order to flank us. But there was no gunshot prior to the scream. It was not the one of pain, either. It was a shriek of horror. A cry of someone who realized that his life was coming to an end, and there was nothing to be done about it. Turning around, I saw only the shaking legs of a soldier who was already being pulled to the door of an old building, as well as the trail of blood that followed them. His pale comrade just stared in bewilderment at the whole scene. It was clear that he must have seen everything, but for some reason he didn't take any action to help his still bellowing companion who, by the sound of it, was already suffocating in his own blood. Yelling something at him, I charged inside, gun ready. I expected to see something as soon as I entered the building, but the trail of blood went around the corner into another room. For someone who was pulling a resisting man, the unknown assailant moved too fast, but I didn't pay it much attention back then. The soldier was still alive. I could hear that. So, without hesitation, I went forward. I expected a bunch of locals with hatchets, showing the most animalistic side of human nature, but the sight that unraveled in front of me didn't fit any of my anticipations. You can't ever expect to see something like that, even on the battlefield. At first, I thought it was a grizzly bear, mostly due to the size of the creature, but also because it was chewing on my companion's neck when I walked in. But it was wearing fishermen's clothes, and even though they clearly didn't fit its massive stature, and when it raised its head to look at me, I saw that its face resembled that of a man, though no more than it resembled the one of the fish. Its white eyes were big and bulbous, but clearly intelligent. There was pure malice in them uncharacteristic for animals. Blood dripped from its thick, fish-like lips right onto the soldier's colorless face, mixing with his tears. And its arms, as big and long as its legs, were pressing the poor guy to the floor, with its long claws piercing his flesh like hooks. Overall, the creature was part man and part something else, like some sort of hybrid crossbreed stuck in development halfway between a man and some ancient dweller of the sea. The creature eyed my rifle for a moment, clearly recognizing what it was before letting out a croaking growl and charging me, moving in short frog-like hops on all fours. My finger pulled the trigger, and the bullet ripped out a large chunk of meat out of its shoulder, but that didn't hinder its advance. I knew that the second shot would come too late, so I turned around and headed for the door that led back to the street, hearing its uneven breathing and the soldier's pleas for help behind me. But while I was out of combat only for a few moments, a lot of things changed. My squad was in full retreat, leaving wounded behind while a few more of those creatures were advancing on them, seemingly not concerned about the enemy's fire. One of the beasts was feasting on my captain right in the middle of the road, cutting me off from the rest of my people. So, without any other options, I headed for the alley that I had noticed before, thinking only about losing those monsters, even if it meant going deeper into their godforsaken town. Once I started running, I didn't even think about direction anymore. 
was just trying to increase the distance between me and those abominations. My heart was pounding and I tried not to think about those left behind. The rest of the soldiers had abandoned me too, after all. The alley was long and narrow, but that worked well for me, since I could just pour every ounce of my strength into running. I knew that I was probably followed, but at the same time I felt as if hundreds of unseen eyes were gazing at me in anticipation of their attack. And every moment I feared that another one of those creatures would lap at me from above and maim me. My only hope was to find a way out of town on my own or to meet up with another squad. The next thing I realized was that an alley came to a dead end. The only thing that surrounded me were high walls with no way to climb up on them. Desperate, I turned around to see if maybe I wasn't followed, but to my horror, the creature was already there, clumsily trying to gain on me with its small hops. There were maybe sixty yards between us, and with each second that distance was getting smaller. I tried shooting at it, but my trembling hands, combined with me being out of breath, made it impossible for me to aim steadily. Remembering how futile were my previous attempts, I turned toward the large warehouse doors next to me, locked on a padlock. Pressing the barrel of my rifle against it, I pulled the trigger. The shot did some damage to the lock, but it remained hanging there. The beast's heavy breathing became apparent. I could see it charging with the corner of my eye, but I wasn't brave enough to even take a look at it to know how much time I had left. Praying for success, I shot the lock for the second time. The bullet ricocheted, but this time the lock fell down, completely destroyed. Without hesitation, I charged at the door, not even bothering to close it behind me as I entered the building. The monster's uneven, heavy footsteps were right around the corner, and I knew that I did not have much time left. Hiding was not an option. I was out of breath and wouldn't be able to keep it down, and instinctively I knew that if the beast wouldn't hear my heart racing, then it would certainly smell my sweat and... fear. I could only run run blindly into the maze of streets and buildings to put some distance between myself and my pursuer, even though I knew that I was an easy target to track for its keen senses. I noticed the small door of a storeroom with a small window nearby. The room was probably intended for the warehouse's security so that they could overlook the shelves of goods. It was my best bet, so I ran towards it, hoping that there would be a door that led back to the streets. Lucky for me, the door was open, so I jumped inside the room and locked it behind me. I was in a hurry, but I still noticed its huge, hunching silhouette against the rectangle of light that was the warehouse's open doors. I didn't see its features clearly anymore, but even the bizarre shape of its body has caused me enough trauma that it will forever haunt me. I turned around, my eyes darting around the small room, barely ten square feet in size, looking for another door only to realize to my horror that there were none. A new wave of fear bolted through me as I realized that I finally caught myself in a trap. I think what got the most to me was that after all of that running, I was still going to die and my efforts were in vain. I didn't see it coming, but I could hear it. The heavy stomps of its legs, the triumphant croaking howl. I pressed my shoulder against the door, hoping to halt the beast's advance. That was naive of me, but I didn't want to go down without putting up a fight. And perhaps were the beast to charge the door, I would die under its feet, but it decided to break through the window instead. The rain of glass missed me, as did the creature's long flailing arms. It only put its torso through the window frame, but its mighty hands could reach halfway across the room. Dazed, I blinked. And in that instant, I felt its hot breath cover my face in blood and saliva. It was looking right at me. Dropping to my knees, I quickly crawled into the far corner of the room, barely evading the hook-like claws, and once there, I turned around, raising my gun. I could see the bloody wound on its shoulder, and the expression of its face made it clear. 
It wasn't just bloodlust. It was personal. That vile, unearthly monster wanted to exact revenge on me for scarring its flesh and it would chase me to the end of the world. Taking a deep breath in, I aimed for its snarling maw and as my fingers squeezed the trigger, I closed my eyes, unable to face the fact that my gun would be harmless to it. Only the shot was followed by silence. I didn't hear its raspy breath anymore. Carefully opening my eyes, I saw the beast hanging from the window. Dead. Its skull now fashioned a large, bloody hole, but even in death its face was stretched in a grimace of hatred and violence. Still not believing what I'd done, I exhaled slowly as if to not awaken the monster in front of me. My uneven breathing turned into a hysterical, giggling laughter as I realized that I survived. For now. But as I was wiping the tears of joy and fear, I came to another realization. I was in the middle of their town. Far from my comrades who at that point could very well be on the outskirts of the town already. And the town itself was infested with fish-like monstrosities. What are those things? Were they the reason why we were deployed here? I don't know these answers, but I don't think their amphibian appearance and the fact that the town is located on the coast of the Atlantic are coincidental. I've never heard of anything like that save for a few fairy tales, but who could believe them before seeing something like this with their own eyes? I don't even want to think about how many of them are there in the ocean and what is the nature of their pact with the locals. Were they always there? In the Atlantic? I think so. Perhaps they observed with their hateful eyes from the depths as the Mayflower was swimming by them, bringing new people into their territory, and since then they resented us, looking for a chance to strike. And perhaps they are everywhere, around the globe, and as we brave their waters more and more, their resentment for us grows until they will no longer tolerate our presence. I fear what might come with the future. Perhaps this battle is just the beginning of another great war. But I know now that they can be killed. And I will do my best to relay this information to my superiors. Chances are they know already, but if they don't, such information could change the tide of this battle. And if I don't make it to them, then I hope that they will find this diary so that we, who were the first to engage these beasts, are not forgotten. And our sacrifice during the Siege of Innsmouth was not in vain. Right now... This diary is the best log of the first fight between humans and the devils that lurk in this accursed town. I don't know where death will find me, but I write this from the cellar underneath the room where my fight took place. Mother. Father. I love you. And I hope that you will be all right. November 24th, 1928. I've decided to stay for the night in the cellar, since judging by the silence that has befallen Innsmouth, the main forces of our army decided to fall back. I didn't want to risk going into the night alone when more of those creatures could be lurking around. I had to get my thoughts together before I was ready to head back into the fight anyway and the cellar provided me with necessary comfort. That said, I had far from a calm night. I could barely close my eyes, fearing that they could track me, and every sound made me jump and grab my gun with bizarre forms haunting my mind. I prayed that the town folk wouldn't send anyone to look for their friend, and that they wouldn't come to the warehouse. Even if this cellar looks like a safe haven... A tight corner that nobody would look into. I didn't want to find out if that was really the case, for I know that above me is the whole town full of those monstrosities, 
A place where no human is welcome, safe. I could only wonder what they were doing at that moment. I've only managed to calm myself down and get some sleep closer to the morning. The night was cold and merciless, but I prayed that those creatures could feel cold and needed rest too. But the rest evaded me even in those fleeting moments. Just when I finally dropped my guard and let my needs take over, the waking horrors gave way to nightmares from which there was no escape. At first those dreams were just the reflection of the previous day. I was being chased by grotesque, ever-shifting forms of the werebeasts who were trampling everyone in their way. No matter where I would go, they would follow me, breaking through doors, windows, bursting out of the floor. They could not catch me, but that was only prolonging my agony as every inch of my body was screaming at me in despair to continue this race and get away from them. The background of the dream was constantly changing not sticking to any recurring motif or logic. I was running through Innsmouth, streets of my hometown, corridors of my school, grocery stores, theaters, every place that I've ever visited, and I knew that I would eventually come to the end of the world had the dream not changed. I suddenly found myself standing at the edge of the cliff that overlooked the sea. The dream wasn't abstract anymore. On the contrary, it was so detailed that I could even feel the breeze of the wind engulf me and see the sun reflect the ocean's gentle surface. My mind also had perfect clarity, as it didn't take me long to realize that I was in a dream, something that had never happened to me before, and that I was seeing it through someone else's eyes. I noticed that I stood abnormally tall, at least eight feet above the cliff's rocky surface, my body was clad in long robes, covered in runes of unknown meaning and depicting numerous sea dwellers in amazing detail, some of which I'd never seen or heard of before. Discarding the robes to the side, the creature that lent me its eyes leapt from the cliff straight down into the water, piercing through its mass with great ease. My new eyes could see underwater very well, and my body moved through the water with terrifying speed. People often tell about dreams in which they fly, but none could imagine what it's like to glide, not atop the gentle winds, but powerful currents. I could sense every motion. My body opened up to new sensations that I never had before. My eyes could see below me to a vast city, built right on the bottom of the ocean. It was located on the slide, and somehow I knew that went on for dozens of kilometers, going deeper and deeper to the depths where no sun could reach its high spires and where its walls defied the monstrous pressure. Its architecture was unlike anything I'd ever seen, with cold rock having unnatural gracefulness that was gifted to it by the hands of an inhuman master. I knew that if I were to walk down the city's corridors, I could see miracles that challenged the boundaries of nature and meet numerous enigmatic travelers, both from our world and others, where flesh was no more than a thing of the past. I saw the dwellers of the ocean's darkest depths, creatures so old they saw the rise and fall of dinosaurs with their black, inky eyes obey the sea folk as if they were their pets. I walked through the tunnels that led deep below the ocean to vast caverns with entire new worlds that never knew the sun and new oceans below them, all native to our planet yet as oblivious about us as we about them. I saw riches beyond imagination of even the wealthiest of our kind, entire mountains of strange white gold, and I knew that all of it was real for my imagination could not come up with something so vast. Join us. The sudden voice in my head commanded. Its soft yet powerful notes echoed through my entire body, every organ and any cell, pushing out not only my other thoughts but even things like instinct and reflexes. I was no more than a string that was played by the masterful hands of an artist.
The vision changed. I was myself again, only completely naked. To my horror, I realized that one of those creatures stood next to me, with clothes not concealing its bulky figure anymore. It was approaching me slowly in a non-threatening way. A moment later, I realized to my disgust that I could clearly see the creature's womanhood. The voice continued. Raise our children. Let your blood run with ours. The meaning of those words became clear to me in a few moments when the beast grabbed me by my arms and lifted me up. Its powerful arms could tear me apart like a wet tissue, but that was not my main concern at that moment. If anything, I'd rather choose death than what was coming. But no matter how much I struggled, how much I wanted to wake up to stop seeing these visions and feeling the creature's cold and wet touch, I had no choice but to just observe... Feeling the mix of shame, horror, and disgusting arousal that invaded my mind and got a grip on my body, controlling it to satisfy the creature's urges. As the creature got what it wanted from me, the voice in my head returned, whispering its warnings. Refuse and pay the consequences. The grey-skinned beast in front of me suddenly started changing, its features waxing and shifting. I observed in horror as it spawned new eyes, maws, claws, and fangs right on its skin that bulged and tore and melted to give way to all these new abominations. No matter how I struggled, I could only watch as that heap of flesh began devouring me. At that moment, I finally woke up. Looking around for any threats that might be nearby, but wherever I looked I could see only bizarre, ever-changing forms of an unnamed beast from my nightmares. Little by little, I calmed down, though the anxiety had already pierced its claws deep into my soul. Whether it's just dreams, or genuine visions cast upon me, those nightmares felt too real, too detailed to be borne by my weary mind. But if they were real, how could we fight such a powerful force? What we fought were no more than spawns of unholy unions of men and beasts, and they had many, many more allies. From what I have seen, I understand that we are no more than temporary occupants of our planet. The ones they tolerate like we tolerate the existence of mice and that they were using like some tools to meet their own god-awful demands. Were they to choose so, they could wipe us all out in an instant, leaving no trace of our civilization for our successors to find, just like they probably did in the past. It all comes down to the show of force here, in Innsmouth. Perhaps if we can't defeat them completely, we could at least buy us some time to develop further, to gather strength. The war to come would be the true war to end all wars. I can hear the gunshots. My company must have begun their advance. Time to go. The corpse of the creature from the other night was gone. It was like it had never been there. I can swear that I didn't hear anything move during the night, not even the crackling of the glass under the beast's massive frame. It's too heavy to move it without making any sound. It's like it just... vanished. November 26th, 1928. I can't speak about other wars, but I know for sure that this war is hell, and in more than one way. I've managed to reconnect with my company during their assault two days ago, and since then we've been steadily progressing into the town. We've been progressing very slowly, measuring each step for every building could hold some unpleasant secret. Whether it was a gun-wielding group of locals, monstrous beasts, or something else entirely. It turned out that I wasn't the only one who had seen that dreamlike vision. Almost every soldier had seen it, and it caused quite a lot of ruckus in our ranks. There have been a lot of cases when soldiers disobeyed the orders, straight out deserted, or simply went mad from all their experiences. 
In just three days, we'd lost a third of our forces. Not to the enemy, but to the horror that had forever settled in their souls. As they would rather face imprisonment than spend one more second on the gloomy, insanity-infested battlefield of Innsmouth. I can't say that I blame them. The town was like a proof that God himself had turned the blind eye to us, letting these monstrosities run free in our land, and our chaplain was never out of work, for many souls began to question their faith and cause. But what could the man in the robe say to people who believed that their very souls were at the risk of being dragged to hell? The promise of paradise seemed faint in comparison to the real, physical nightmare that we were facing. It is clear now that our enemy employs not only the brute force, but some sort of mystic arts as well. Throughout the last two days, it had been raining non-stop, which I doubt is a mere coincidence, as water seems to rejuvenate these creatures. I personally saw how a mortally wounded creature crawled out of the building and into the rain, only to hop away with a newfound strength. It is also impossible to capture these beasts dead or alive. They fight too ferociously until death, and upon it their corpses seem to disappear as soon as we look away even for a moment. Many begin to doubt whether they are even real, or if they are mirages of some sort. But then we wouldn't be able to kill them, not to mention that we know that mirages look different. One of the squads went completely insane after they encountered a creature similar to the ones we'd been facing all the time, but many times bigger. With its head towering high above buildings and its arms using the roofs as a support, it appeared out of the thin air, walked a few yards toward them, and then dissipated. But that was enough for half of them to commit suicide out of sheer fear. The rest of them degraded to the point where they lost their power of speech, and words that described what happened were mixed with blabberings of unknown language that no one had managed to identify. Another squad went missing right in their camp, though their footsteps led to the cellars of the nearby building. Nobody had seen them leave, and the basement itself was empty. They didn't take their guns or any other equipment with them, either, which led their captain to believe that they were traitors or deserters. Though everyone present understood that he said that only to avoid spreading further panic. The locals attack us at any time, from any angle. We constantly feel their gazes upon us, and no matter how many defenses we set up, they always find a way to break through them. Where they lack in numbers, they win with their knowledge of their surroundings and raw animalistic power. Of course, not all locals were affected by the curse of flesh that had consumed the majority of the population. Some of them were normal humans who had lived alongside the rest of the population. Some of them were even supporting our cause and joining our ranks, seeing it as their chance to get rid of the plague that had threatened them for their entire lives. One of such people was Henry Harrison, a young man who, despite his lifeless eyes, possessed quite a zealous determination to drive the creatures back to the sea. He had been born in Innsmouth and lived there his whole life, with the knowledge that one day he would have to either face death or consummate the marriage with one of those things. We'd found him along with a bunch of others like him when their barricaded house was being sieged by the sea folk. And even though it could be a trap, we just couldn't stand there and observe how those creatures were trying to get inside. He later told us that they had been fighting back for two days straight, from the moment the so-called Cult of Dagon learned about their insurrection, and out of fifteen people, only four survived. The rest had been either maimed or killed right there or taken alive somewhere else. Two of the corpses that we had found at that building had gunshot wounds in their heads, and judging by the angle, those poor souls were the ones who did it to themselves. Henry said that in their case, death was an easy way out, and warned us that we better not become their prisoners of war, for we would only make it worse for our comrades. He refused to specify what he meant by that. Henry and his followers were a treasure for our campaign, for they possessed vast knowledge about the town's structure and the dangers that awaited us there, even if they seemed to be completely surreal from his words. He also shared a great deal of information regarding the origins of these creatures and what they were doing in the city. 
According to him, these creatures were brought to the town by a captain named Abed Marsh in the middle of the last century. On his voyages through the Pacific, he had encountered a tribe that had established contact with this bizarre race and made an unholy pact with them. Those creatures would marry into their families in order to mix their blood with ours and avoid inbreeding. And in return, they would give the settlers all the wealth and fish they needed. Abed saw an opportunity for his own town to prosper, so he brought the despicable cult with him. And on a bloody night in 1845, the creatures marched out of the waters and took over the town, killing or sacrificing everyone who would oppose them. Henry said that the children of mixed blood would look like a normal human at first, but as they got older, their dark origin would start to take over, changing their features to resemble those of their ocean-dwelling ancestors, the oldest ones. The ones from the first generation had already joined the rest in the ocean, but they kept nearby just in case. And, according to Henry, the ones that we had seen were no more than a tadpole compared to their seniors, who possessed unparalleled power that was granted to them by something even more sinister and ancient. Something that their cult of Dagon had been worshipping since the times when dinosaurs walked the earth. Henry assured us that he wasn't one of the hybrids, but he told us that his family was not left untouched by those atrocities. His grandparents had been serving their town vigorously, sometimes committing atrocious acts outside of the town where the mixed ones couldn't go without attracting attention to themselves, all to prove their loyalty to the cult and let their family stay the way it was. Henry admitted that he carried that knowledge as a burden for his grandparents were responsible for dozens of kidnappings all over the state. They mostly kidnapped children, since they were both easy targets and in high demand at the cult. What the cult did to them remained unknown, but Henry suspected that his grandparents consciously avoided the truth. But as the plague was spreading through the city and more and more families were being picked for integration, Henry's family ultimately fell victim to it as well. When Henry was seven, his mother mysteriously disappeared. His father wasn't the same ever since, saying that his mother was with gods. But his thousand-yard stare told Henry more than his words. His father didn't just suffer from the loss. He also carried the weight of knowledge of what exactly had happened to her. It was then... When Henry learned for the first time what world he lived in, as if the mere presence of those ageless prehistoric beasts rubbed off on him, making the seven-year-old grow up in one night. A few weeks later, Henry met his new mother. A croaking voice behind the bedroom's always closed door. His father insisted that Henry should never enter the bedroom, since his new mother was... sick and had to rest all the time. But while Henry obeyed, that didn't stop his stepmother from taking midnight walks, as was evident by the pools of water that Henry could occasionally find in the corridor. One time, he woke up to find one such puddle, along with dirty, inhuman footsteps, near his bed. Exactly nine months later, he got himself a new sister, a newborn girl as sweet as any other. But Henry couldn't be fooled. He knew that one day that innocent soul would grow up into a cold-blooded, dark-eyed monster just like her mother, and maybe even demand for him to take the third oath. An oath to raise her children. On the night before his rebellion, he took his father's gun from the cellar and shot her right between her sweet little eyes. Her mother wasn't around to protect her, instead choosing to ravage the battlefield. But Henry was sure that she would personally come after him. Henry mentioned that the town had a vast network of tunnels under it that connected most of the buildings together in one big maze, and he promised to help us find one of the entrances, but he warned us against going down there. And he refused to go there himself, instead opting for us to blow the whole thing up. It explained how the cultists and their family members could find their way into our flanks, so sealing the tunnel seemed like a good idea, but our superiors decided that sending a small heavily armed squad down there could prove useful, 
as it presented an opportunity to strike right at the heart of the enemy. Tomorrow, tomorrow, it will be decided who shall go there. Don't forget to join us again next week for part two and the stunning conclusion to The Siege of Innsmouth. The Siege of Innsmouth was written by Artyom Derechuk. Artyom Derechuk is an English-speaking Ukrainian writer who lives in Moscow, Russia. Drawing inspiration from his post-USSR environment and mythology of numerous peoples that live there, Derechuk aims to craft the most intricate, spine-chilling, and bizarre stories that he can. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted, and its featured stories performed by, yours truly, Jason Hill. Additional performers have been featured when necessary to bring the tales to life. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respected authors. Sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Luke Hodgkinson under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's artwork and logo by Jason Hill. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure that you never miss an episode. And please, leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Thursday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button too to tell us how we're doing. Oh. And if you could, please leave a kind word, or even a request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more, and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for more than 500 free audio horror stories, including more performance from yours truly, and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, You'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Thursday with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, this is Jason Hill. Good evening. <laughs>